All right, so I just want to welcome everyone, um, let you know that we are recording this presentation so that we can put it up on our YouTube channel, as well as send it out to any participants who couldn't make it today um, for the live presentation. Um, for those of you who um, would like to enable closed captions, um, you can do that at the bottom of your Zoom window by clicking live transcript and then show subtitles. Um, and I just want to thank you for joining us for this learning program about nibbling on native plants in your backyard and beyond. I'm Mariah Fogg, the Community Conservation Manager for the Berkshire Natural Resources Council. And in addition to our presenter, I'm joined tonight by Rich Montone, the Director of Fundraising, and Charlotte Hood, um, a Volunteer and Outreach Assistant. For those who are unfamiliar, Berkshire Natural Resources Council is a regional land trust actively working throughout Berkshire County um, on land conservation, land stewardship, and community engagement. BNRC conserves land to protect water resources and wildlife habitat for climate resilience and to connect people to nature through accessibility and engaging activities. Um, given the topic tonight, we did want to share that BNRC does allow responsible foraging on reserves um, for individual consumption, and we're going to share some resources in the follow-up email about how to responsibly forage. Um, so that connection to nature um, that we are talking about can take many forms. Um, it could be enjoying trails in nature, bird watching from your window, and supporting local farms. Um, it can really be deepened um, by learning and engaging with the land. So I'd like for us to pause for a moment and acknowledge the deep connection of the Mohican people to this land, their historic homelands. They called themselves the people of the waters that are never still, the Mahekana'uk. And they lived and cared for what we now call the Berkshires and well beyond for thousands of years before Europeans forcibly seized their lands with neither shame nor remorse. And today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. These lands continue to be of great significance to the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican people with numerous ways to engage, learn, and continue to deepen your connection to these lands. Um, we'll also send some resources in the follow-up email about that. Um, we ask that you please give thought to the native land that you're zooming in from. And with that, I'll pass it over to Rich Montone. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Rich Montone. I'm the director of fundraising at BNRC. This program is free this evening, thanks to BNRC donors. So thank you all. Thank you, donors. BNRC is a donor funded organization. So all of the conservation, the wildlife habitat protection, the support of farmers, all of the work that builds climate resilience, all of the free access to the Berkshire outdoors at all the BNRC reserves across the county. That's all thanks um, to donors making it possible. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to put a link in the chat to the page where you can donate if you would like to. It so happens we've got a challenge match in play this month. So if you did donate in the month of June, you would get your money matched one to one until we exhaust that challenge fund. And it also looks like my colleagues generously put a QR code on the screen that you can snap and use to donate. So that's terrific too. So thank you for all your support and I'm really looking forward to Russ's program tonight. Glad that you're here. Hi everyone. I'm excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Russ Cohen. Until his retirement in June of 2015, Russ Cohen's day job was serving as the Rivers Advocate for the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration, where one of his areas of expertise was in riparian vegetation. Now Russ has more time to pursue his passionate avocation, which is connecting to nature via his taste buds and assisting others in doing the same. In addition to leading over three dozen foraging walks and talks each year at a wide variety of venues throughout the Northeast, Russ has now taken on the role of Johnny Appleseed for edible native species. He has set up a small nursery in Western, in Western Massachusetts where he grows and keeps plants that he propagates from seed, he is then partnering with land trusts, cities and towns, schools and colleges, state and federal agencies, tribal groups, organic farms, and others to plant the plants from his nursery in appropriate places on their properties. 
Russ has initiated over two dozen projects in the past six years. And one that some of you might be familiar with is uh, the Great Barrington Land Conservancy's Riverwalk in Great Barrington. So uh, one last note before I hand it off to Russ, we have a dedicated Q&A session towards the end of the discussion tonight. And um, just make sure to jot down your questions if they come up along the way. All right, Russ, take it away. So thank you all, um, Mariah, Charlotte, and Rich for inviting me to give this talk. And let me see if I can get my screen to work. Whoops, I went too far. Let's put up the welcome screen again. All right, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm talking to you from Arlington, Massachusetts, which is the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts tribe. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that. And in addition, I mean, this is a, a slide that a lot of uh, land trusts use at the beginning of their talks to talk about um, the uh, places where tribes have had a long heritage of uh, living for thousands of years. But I like to go beyond this topic to talk about a couple other aspects of the uh, uh, indigenous presence in our area. And that is that uh, much of the information I'm going to share with you today is stuff that the indigenous people of this region figured out in the thousands of years that they were here and needing to interact with the environment by foraging and doing other things with plants. So boy, am I grateful that that knowledge has trickled down to me and I'm happy to share it with you and to uh, give it back to Native Americans. And also uh, I give back the plants themselves because uh, one of the aspects of uh, colonization was the removal of the indigenous plant community from so many of our lands. And so, uh, as you'll see through the examples today, uh, I'm growing these plants and then giving them back to the landscape so the landscape can uh, re-indigenize itself. Uh, it's another aspect of land back. It's it's the knowledge back and the plants back is in addition to the lands back. And um, so besides knowing what's edible, uh, also, in, in, a, a core fundamental principle of indigenous teachings, as I understand it, is the uh, importance of not taking too much and to have forbearance and restraint when you're interacting with plants. This is particularly important when native species are involved. Because native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food or some other important portion of their life cycle. So it's really important to um, to not uh, take too much from native species uh, that would upset the ecological balance in any way. And if I were to direct your attention to a great source of information on this topic, it's uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. And I had the great opportunity to uh, spend an entire weekend with Robin at Kripalu. She put on a workshop around this time last year. And I understand, I understand that she's coming back again in August. And so if there's any space left to uh, take part in that weekend at Kripalu with Robin, I, I encourage you to do it if you possibly can. But uh, uh, in the meantime, if you haven't read Bra Braiding Sweetgrass, it is a totally wonderful book. Uh, and, uh, and in that book, besides uh, sharing many stories, as Robin does, about uh, the uh, edible medicinal qualities of native plants, she also talks about this importance of um, of interacting with the landscape in a really respectful way. And she's got an entire chapter associated with that topic. And the chapter is called The Honorable Harvest. And in that chapter are these principles that she's developed. And I liken this to the 10 commandments of foraging. And she has suggested that people might even make a laminated copy of this Honorable Harvest principles and take it with them when they go out into the woods as a way of, um, uh, as a methodology to go through as you're deciding, uh, is this a, the, a proper thing for me to do to be gathering this plant and harvesting it? And so uh, that would be good advice to follow. Okay, especially for the native plants, but then at the other end of the spectrum, we have edible invasive plants. And, um, 
And I thought I was going to have a slide in here about that, but I'll just say that, you know, there's some wonderfully edible weeds and invasive plants. And so when I'm out on the landscape doing a, a wild edibles walk, I'm not limiting myself to just the native species. I'm talking about Japanese knotweed, dames rocket, autumn olive, um, uh, plants like dandelions and stinging nettles and um, purslane and many other wonderful weeds. And actually, there those, um, you know, the abundant weeds and invasive species, you can be much more relaxed about gathering them because they're so abundant and they have much less of an important ecological role. In fact, they may even have an ecological detriment. But the, the theme of this topic, though, is what we would deliberately plant in our yards uh, that might be edible and native. So before I talk about the edibility part, let's talk about the native part. So were this to be a live program, I'd ask everybody in the audience, how many of you have not heard of this guy, Doug Talmy, this guy right here? And uh, I am still giving talks where almost everybody's hand goes up, which astonishes me because among the native plant people, this guy is number one. He's at the top of the uh, apex of uh, considered to be the experts and the gurus in the topic of, of uh, native plants. And, um, and here's the way he got there is he's an entomologist and he made this very astute observation a number of years ago that when our cherished migratory songbirds return from their wintering grounds and they pair up, they build their nests, they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch, where are those parent birds going to find the caterpillars and other foods that they want to feed their babies in the nest? They're going to native plants. And why is that? It's because since, uh, and they're not finding the caterpillars on the non-native plants. So why is that? And the reason is because since plants can't move, their major defense is chemical and that's how they prevent being eaten to death. And so they have chemical defenses and our native insects have found ways to get around those chemical defenses, not so much as to wipe those plants out because that would be very counterproductive for the native insects, but so they can eat them. And the plants and insects are in this dynamic equilibrium. They're getting along fine over time, but the non-native plants have no insects on them. And it's because the, the, our insects haven't had a chance to evolve with the non-native plants in the environment. So, so a, a, a bird trying to fly through a neighborhood with all non-native plants in it, it's like a food desert to them. They can't find the food to feed their babies. So that's the point that Doug makes, why it's really important for us all to plant native plants. And here's a book that Doug put out, Nature's Best Hope. And Nature's Best Hope, according to Doug, is all of us. He wants, he thinks that all, we all should be planting native plants. And I think it's a very good point. And so, uh, so as Doug and other native plant advocates are getting out there, just spreading the word about how important it is to plant native for ecological reasons, there's wonderful guides that are put out. There's printed versions, there's online versions, uh, various state governments are getting into, various nonprofits are getting into it, and, and this is all really important. And uh, here I want to give an example of a land trust that's doing this. So this is the Aspetec Land Trust that covers a four-town area in southwest Connecticut. And they made a very astute observation that as many open space parcels as they can preserve, the job isn't going to get done of uh, creating the pathways for pollinators and, and, and native animals to be able to move through the landscape unless homeowners are also planting native in their yards and they have assigned a full-time person on their staff and all they do is encourage homeowners to plant native plants. And I think this is a brilliant idea and something perhaps the BNRC should continue be, consider because uh, I'm guessing that many, if not most of the BNRC members are homeowners, perhaps second homeowners, but anyway, that have the opportunity to plant native plants in the yard. So the same people that are encouraging BNRC to acquire tracks of open space and put trails in them, they also have the opportunity to plant native on their own properties. And so uh, here's a really good precedent to follow of a land trust that's encouraging their members to do just that. Okay, so let me tell you a story about a talk I went to. This is about a decade ago, uh, given by a woman named Kate Venturini, who's from Rhode Island. And she was trying to encourage people to plant natives along the shore of Narragansett Bay to help absorb pollutants from getting to the bay, you know, running off the lawns and parking lots and stuff like that. So in her talk, she had a chart like this. And I'm sure many of you have seen charts like this. We have the name of the plant on the left side, and then you have all these columns to the right side with various attributes of the plants. Grows tall, grows short, like sun, like shade, all that stuff. So I went up to Kate at the end of her talk and I said, Kate, where's your edibility column? 
And she said, oh, we don't tell people that. And I said, why not? And she said, we don't want people to eat these plants. We want them to leave them for the wildlife. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You've got blueberry on your list. Are you suggesting that people plant blueberry plants and then never go out and pick a blueberry themselves? Oh, we wouldn't do that. And I said, well, then you might as well tell them what plants are also edible. And so now in Rhode Island, they have an edibility column. And so here is the theme of this talk, the fact that many of our native plants are edible by people too, I think provides an additional powerful incentive for people to plant them that might be insufficiently induced to do so just in the pure ecological rationale. So pardon me while I dwell on stereotypes for just a minute. So in my mind, I imagine married couple, husband and wife, good sized lot, in the Berkshires, wherever you, wherever they are, and the wife has heard Doug Tallamy's talk, or she's read Doug Tallamy's book, and she says to the husband, hey, it's really important for us to plant native. It's really important. And the husband says, I like the yard the way it is. I don't want to change anything. And that's when she could bring him to one of my talks or this online program, and it's the what's in it for me angle. Uh, you know, I don't think realistically it's going to get everybody to rip out their lawn and put in native plants, but my feeling is that you know, it gives them another excuse because it doesn't have to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be, this is just going to be a lawn and, um, you know, I'm going to call all the uh, fumigators to kill everything else that's on our property. You know, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is the sacrifice zone where you just say, no, this yard is just natural habitat and it's all for them. I'm never going to pick a berry because a bird might need that berry. I'm going to leave it all for them. We can share. And that's the point of this talk is that you can plant enough edible natives in your yard. So there's enough for the wildlife to enjoy and you can too. All right. So let's go on with uh, the rest of the talk on this theme. So your first question might be, how do I know a species of native? Well, a really great uh, uh, resource to figure that out is the Go Botany web page, which is part of the Native Plant Trust, used to be called the New England Wildflower Society. And here on the left is the page for Spicebush. And you'll see this map of New England is a county outline map. So those are county boundaries. So there's Berkshire County down there. And you'll see, so this is the page for Spicebush, we'll talk, I'll talk about later in my show. And spicebush is a native species in New England, and that, and you know that because all the counties are colored in green. If this color had been pink, that tells you it's a non-native species. So that's one way to know. And then an issue that some people care about is ecoregion, is not only should the plant be native to the area, that where you're getting the plant from or the seed from should also be local. And I've heard some very um, reasonable minds differing on this. I think that an argument can be made that if you are able to source a plant for your yard uh, where the seed was local uh, and or the plant was raised locally, I think an argument can be made that that plant is likely to uh, uh, do better in your yard because it's had a chance to adapt to regional conditions. So I, I will agree with that. Okay, and um, if you're wondering where to get seed to grow plants on your own, uh, the Wild Seed Project is a great source for native seed, including a bunch of native edible species. I've listed some examples here. And, um, and if though, that intimidates you, the idea of growing your own plants from seed, and you said, well, I, I think I'm just better off. I, I know myself, and I'm better off just buying the plants. So there's several places to do that in the Berkshires, including the Helian Native Nursery, which is right in the Alford West Stockbridge line. Uh, there's Breesh McCracken, who uh, grows these plants, and uh, many from seed. And she offers uh, workshops on edible native species. And I know that because she invited me to give one several years ago. So that's a, a great place to go. Okay, and uh, the last thing before I start plowing into the actual topic about, you know, all the delicious details about specific edible native species, uh, I just want to give you one more helpful hint. And that is for those of you that say, okay, uh, I'm convinced I want to plant edible natives, but what would work in my yard? So this is when you can go back to the Native Plant Trust and they have a native plant finder. Sometimes they call it a garden plant finder. It's a portion of their website. And what they do is they have all these various boxes that you can check that represent your conditions. I've got a sunny side, I've got a shady side, I've got a slopey side, I've got a dry side. Whatever it is, you just punch in the parameters and then the algorithm will spit out the plants that are suitable for the parameters that you've asked for. So I thought I would just check the edible box and see what happens when you do that. 
and up pop 80 different species. That's not bad. There's actually more than 190 species that are native to Northeast eco regions that are edible by people, but 80 is a pretty good representative sample. So then I clicked on sweet fern, and then here's the sweet fern page. And so you get all kinds of details about where sweet fern likes to grow, its range beyond Massachusetts, and, and that's all interesting. Okay, so now that I've shown you that, let's talk about specific plants. And I'm going to apologize in advance for something that is very unorthodox in the terms of other people's talks, where they'll say, here's all the plants that grow in the sun. Here's all the plants that grow in the shade. Here's all the tall plants. Here's all the short plants. I don't think that way because I am a forager. And so I think about what's ripe in the spring, what's ripe in the summer, what's ripe in the fall. And so my plants are organized by season of edibility. So let's start with stuff in the spring. Okay, so now you folks in the Berkshires where this is a relatively common plant, you may not, you may all know this plant really, really well. But in Eastern Mass where I'm talking to you from, this is one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make is they'll be walking in the woods in the spring and they'll see a bunch of ferns at this curled up fiddlehead stage and they'll say to themselves, Oh, fiddleheads, boy, that looks an awful lot. What I've seen for sale in the stores or the fancy restaurants, it must be the same thing. So they pick it and they bring it home and they cook it up and it tastes horrible. And they say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvested wrong species of fern. I only know of two species of fern that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity. And that is this one. This is the quote unquote fiddlehead fern, the one that you do see for sale in the stores and the produce markets. And as far as I know, nobody is cultivating ostrich fern. And so if you're seeing uh, the fiddleheads in the produce bin or on a restaurant menu, it was gathered from the wild. And that's not intrinsically bad. I mean, that's the whole theme of this talk is to talk to you about plants that are growing in the wild or that you can plant in your own yards. It's just the way they're harvesting this plant. And so this is a good example of how uh, the forbearance and restraint I talked about with interacting with native plants. Uh, so you'll see this is very typical clump of the ostrich fern fiddleheads. And you'll see you get about a half a dozen of the cold up parts per clump. So what I recommend is just take one or maybe two of the cold up parts per clump and that's it, leave the rest there and let them unfurl and be mature. And that is a totally sustainable level of harvesting the plant, it could definitely stand for that kind of harvesting. But unfortunately, what some of the people do that the pick for the restaurants and the chefs is they pick every single fiddlehead they, they see. And you can really sap a lot of strength and rise them if you do that. You can kill the ferns if you're harvesting them that hard. So just one or two per clump. Okay, so I want to go back to uh, indigenous knowledge for just a second here and talk about this species to just illustrate the fact that sometimes in indig indigenous language, there's some really great practical information embedded there that it's really cool to know. And I learned that for the ostrich fern from an ethnobotanist who's actually from uh, the Pacific Northwest. But anyway, I learned from her that the Maliseet tribe, and this is a, a tribe in, in Northeast um that their traditional homeland straddles the main New Brunswick border, that their word they use to uh, for ostrich fern fiddleheads is the same exact term they use to describe the circling motion a dog makes before it lies down. And once you put those two together, it's like, yeah, of course, that's a, it, you know, the curling up that's very similar. Uh, and so it's really cool where to, to learn uh, the indigenous names of plants and to learn what they mean because sometimes there's really cool information embedded in that knowledge. Okay, so here I could have taken this photo along the Housatonic River. As it happens, I took along the Connecticut River, but this is your typical habitat for the ostrich ferns where you're going to see it growing wild. And, um, and here's the last thing I, I look for when I'm looking for the ostrich ferns that distinguish it from other kinds of ferns. It's these fertile fronds of the spore bearing fronds, and, um, and they'll be out uh, also at the fiddlehead stage. Um, so not just when the uh, the fronds have unrolled, uh, but when they're at the um, fiddlehead stage. And if you cut their little stems in cross section, they also form that U shape in cross section like the uh, fiddleheads do. So look for that. Now, if you have bought fiddleheads at the produce store and brought them home and cooked them up and weren't very impressed with them, you might want to try this cooking method, which is amply demonstrated by this naturalist, Beth Basler, who took a bunch of us to a patch of fiddleheads growing along the Connecticut River in Northfield, Mass. And she brought her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were truly exquisite that way. So, um, 
So fiddleheads uh, are, are are planted in just you know your regular you know suburban landscapes. So here's an example near where I live in Lexington, Massachusetts, where they're just growing in somebody's backyard, just right along the roadside. And uh, and this is a plant that if it's happy, it will uh, spread through its rhizomes. And so you get a few ferns established and over time, you'll get a nice good sized patch like this. Now, I don't know this for sure, but my hunch is that the family who owns the property where this plant is growing have no clue that this is actually the edible ostrich fern. They're just enjoying it because it looks nice, which is perfectly fine. Okay, so here is marsh marigold, and uh, I've seen patches. Uh, actually, there's one near uh, Brescia and the Healy Natives Nursery, an enormous one where there are thousands of these plants growing in an alder thicket. Uh, so, but even so, this is a really cherished spring wildflower, and I certainly wouldn't want to pick this plant to any extent that would in any way reduce its ability to thrive in the location where it's growing. So, I'm recommending that people pick just one or two leaves per plant, that's it. And the best time to pick the plant, the, the leaves off the plant, if you wanna eat them, is actually before the flowers bloom. So before I took this photo, when the flowers are in buds, or even before then, and you have to boil these leaves at least once to make them safe to eat, and then they taste like spinach. And you might say to yourself, I think I'll just go to the store, the, 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 you know, the organic farm produce stand and buy the uh, spinach leaves. And I totally support you in, in that. But I want to keep this plant in my show because this was a really important food in the days like before the Second World War, when people, you know, weren't able to get leafy green vegetables any time of the year they want, like we can these days. And so uh, they would seek out the um, uh, herbaceous perennial native plants like the ostrich fern fiddleheads and the marsh marigold leaves as a way of being able to eat green things before the green things were even showing up in their um in their gardens. And I also like to put marsh marigold in the show because this is a plant that's easily propagated by seeds. So this is, if you see where my arrow is, that's what the seeds looks like. So in, in my area, this happens on June 3rd. In the Berkshires, you may still be able to find uh, marsh marigold plants with seeds on it like that. And you can collect the seeds and you can store them or sow them right away. And I have grown uh, many marsh marigold plants in my nursery from seed I gathered from wild plants. It's really fun. And then you can plant them in your yard. Uh, okay, so now this species, um, you find a fair amount in the Berkshires because you have the higher pH soil that we don't have where I'm talking to you from in Eastern Mass. So you're, you're lucky to have this species. And you may know, some of you, already what it is. I'll tell you what it is in just a second. But first of all, I want to tell you that this is a plant that uh, will grow in the higher limestone based soil, you know, from the Midwest into New England and a little bit into um, um, the Canadian provinces. And it's a species Native Americans knew well and ate extensively. In fact, uh, the city name Chicago and Winooski, Vermont are derived from place names for this plant in the respective indigenous languages, which basically meant places where a lot of this plant grows. And um, and once uh, the colonists came to the Berkshires and they encountered this plant, they would harvest it to folks that lived in the rural areas of the Berkshires, which is most of the Berkshires actually, would you know gather a little bit of this plant where they'd be out trout fishing, turkey hunting, and all that was fine. And they called the plant wild leek, which is its traditional New England name. So all that was fine until about 20 years ago when this species began to experience a meteoric rise in popularity because all the chefs and foodies started hyperventilating about it and they started to use its Southern Appalachian name, which is Ramps. And unfortunately what happened as a result is there was a bit of a gold rush mentality and I hope this isn't happening anymore. It certainly was in the early 2000s where people would go out to the woods and they'd find a patch of wild leeks like this and they'd dig them all up, every single plant. So they'd basically extirpate a patch. So there's a, for example, in some of the DCR properties in the Berkshires, I used to encounter patches like this and I've go on to the woods after that and every plant would be gone. That's obviously not a sustainable way of harvesting the plant. So here's another view of a patch of the wild leeks. And you'll see that they like the rich woods habitat where plants like the Dutchman's breeches will grow. And uh, also a lot of our cherished other wildflowers like um, 
uh, trilliums and blood roots and stuff like that. And so, um, so the so the the habitats are also sensitive, and so if people come and just dig these plants up and they leave any bare soil behind, they're creating the ideal growing medium for the garlic mustard and the other invasive species to sneak in and establish a toehold in these sensitive rich woods habitats. So that would also be bad. So here's a close up of what the plants look like. So each plant will have uh, two or sometimes three leaves that go down to a small bulb that's like a scallion, and um, and here's the good news. You do not have to dig up these plants to eat them because the leaves are delicious. And so that's the advice I've been trying to get out to anybody that's gathering wild leeks in the wild. Actually, anybody that's gathering wild leeks at all is please consider uh, shifting your harvesting to just leaves only and ideally just one leaf per plant. Leave the other leaf, attach the bulb and leave the bulb in the ground. That's a totally sustainable way of harvesting this plant. And then the patches will continue to thrive uh, into the future. So, uh, so I won't dwell on this, but this is a photo I took from um, a famous restaurant down in Westchester County, New York, Dan Barber's um, uh, stone uh, barn at Blue Hills, a uh, Blue Hills Stone Barns restaurant, where he's not even using the rant bulbs in his recipes. He's just pickling them and selling them at a gift shop. And this slide, I'm a, uh, I have to tell you, I took at the food co-op in Great Barrington, and I raised a little stink about this because also the roots were attached to these plants. They weren't one leaf per plant uh, ramps. They were dug up. And so, um, so let me give you at least anecdotal evidence that I think the tide is shifting a little bit in how plants these plants are being harvested. So I got an email uh, where the subject line was wild ramps and I thought, oh great, some foodie uh, has tracked me down and has written me to divulge location of some patch of the wild leeks so they can go plunder it. And it turned out that that email was from the produce manager of the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, which is the one that serves Montpelier, Vermont. And they were, were writing me to tell me that based on what they learned from me, they had decided to sell only small bags of just one leaf per plant harvested wild leek leaves at their food co-op. And they wanted permission for me to put a little message from me inside each bag to explain why that was a good idea. So obviously I was thrilled that they were doing it that way. And I thank them profusely for that. Okay, so here's some more good news. You can propagate wild wild leeks and you don't have to gather them from the wild. And this is being done uh, by Garden of the Woods. So this is the Native Plant Trust Eastern Mass facility in Framingham Mass, where they have these stock beds that they cram full of wild leeks and the plants will just fill in vegetatively. And then they can pull out a small percentage of those plants every so often. And then what they do is they pot these plants up and then they sell them with other native plants at their wild plant store at um, uh, Garden of the Woods. And there's a Western Mass uh, 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 satellite for the Native Plant Trust where you can also buy these plants and that's called Nasami Farm. It's in Waitley, Mass. It's in the Connecticut Valley. And so, uh, so this would be a great way to establish your own wild leek patch on your own property. But if you do that, I bet you're not going to dig those plants up because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you'd harvest the leaves from the plants and enjoy them and leaves the bulbs in the ground. And that way you'll continue to have those plants to enjoy for the future. All right, so here's another native plant with an important ecological role. And this is the common milkweed, the only one that's edible by humans. So swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, none of those other milkweeds are edible. It's just a common milkweed. This whole chapter in my book about eating milkweed, and I called it a procrastinating forager's dream food because there's at least four edible stages to eating the plant, and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess, mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while to the next edible stage develops. So this is actually edible stage number three, which the plants uh, that I saw today when I was out in the field, they're at this stage right now. When these uh, buds are in a tight uh, cluster, you have to boil them for seven minutes to make them safe to eat. And then um, they will not shrink or get on mushy on you even after all that boiling. So you see the milkweed buds in this bowl right here, they have been boiled for seven minutes and look how well they held up. If, look, if anything, they look even nicer than they did when they were attached to the plant. So you could eat these just plain as a side dish if you wanted to, a really good way to use them is this recipe from my book, which is called milkweed egg puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole. And even the pods, when they're up to an inch long, you can boil them for seven minutes and the flavor and the texture is really similar to green beans. 
All right, but here is the monarch butterfly caterpillar to remind us that this and all the other members of the Sclepius genus that grow uh, naturally are important for the monarch butterflies to lay their eggs on and the caterpillars uh, to eat the leaves and so on. And so uh, I wanna make sure that there's lots of milkweed plants around. Uh, so I'm actively propagating this plant from seed in my nursery. I'm planting it out on my sides and I planted it in my own yard. So let me just quickly tell you that story. So uh, so there's my house in the background. I have another car now. I still have that boat. And here is the blueberries we planted on the edge of our driveway. And we've allowed the common milkweed to grow with our blueberries. And the butterflies have found them. They've laid their eggs on that. And we know that because one year we found this chrysalis attached to our garage door. And fortunately it attached on a hinge. So when the door went up and down, the chrysalis just went for a ride up and down and it was there for two weeks. And then one morning we went out and it was empty because the butterfly metamorphosed and flown away. So this is a great example of how you can um, uh, walk the walk on your own property to plant native plants, especially imp ecologically important native plants like the common milkweed. Okay, sassafras. Um, sassafras does grow wild in the Berkshires. It's not as common as it is in Eastern Mass, where I'm from, but I do see it. And um, it's a plant with leaves with three different shapes on the same plant, no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs on the same plant. So it's exceedingly easy to recognize. There's two edible parts on a sassafras. The root bark has that very familiar characteristic root beer aroma, which you can make sassafras tea from. Uh, in my book, I've got a recipe for sassafras candy, which is like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better because it's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. Having said all that, the Food and Drug Administration thinks that th th these roots could possibly be carcinogenic because a study that was done on saffron, which is an essential oil that's in the sassafras root bark, where they fed a huge amount of it to rats, some of those rats got cancer. And based on that, the Food and Drug Administration has banned saffron containing sassafras products from the food supply. And that ban's been in effect for 70 years now. Uh, so um, now I've heard other stories that say, well, it may be carcinogenic to rats, but humans can safely metabolize the saffron. We don't have that issue. But even so, if you hear that the Food and Drug Administration thinks this might be carcinogenic and you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to stay away from the sassafras root bark for that reason. I totally support you in that. In fact, I totally support you wherever your comfort level is about anything I talk about in this show. If you're nervous about, have I gathered the right species or am I gathering it from a place where it hasn't been sprayed with herbicides or there isn't contamination from uh, a formerly contaminated site or, or roadway pollution, whatever, and you chicken out, you don't harvest it. I think that's pretty sensible. Okay, but there is a part of the sassafras where saffron is not an issue and that are the young sassafras leaves. So if you've ever heard of filet powder, which is what filet gumbo is made from, filet powder is dried powdered young sassafras leaves. So the leaves, even in the Berkshires, are a little bit too late for the for the best stage to harvest, uh, to make the powder, you want to do it when the leaves are about uh, an inch long, which is about uh, three or four weeks ago. And you don't want to strip all the leaves off all the plants. You want to pick a leaf here, a leaf there, and make sure you're not denuding the plants. But then you just gather the leaves, dry them, pulverize them, make a powder from them, and then just add that powder to your soups and stews, whatever you want to thicken in flavor right at the end, right before you serve it. And another reason you might want to plant sassafras in your yard, it's a really underappreciated fall foliage plant. It's a totally gorgeous plant. Okay, so here is basswood, Hi, and there's, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know your video um, is frozen. Oh. It has been for a little bit. I'm yeah. not sure if just turning yeah, it off you, with that on you. would work, but right. audio is fine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see if uh, I can do that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, let's do this once. And if I freeze again, then so be it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for uh, pointing that out. Absolutely. Okay. Because really the important part is... Uh, what I'm showing on the screen. Okay, sure so thing. I see that I'm back. To work. Yeah. All right, great. I'm glad you can still hear me though. Okay, so here is the native basswood and whether it's the native basswood or the street tree, the little leaf linden, they're edible the exact same way. So the young leaves are edible and you can make a tea from these flowers. And this plant is already blooming in the Boston area. So it won't be long for it to be blooming in the Berkshires. And this plant has a wonderful fragrance like lemon and honey and you make a tea from the flowers. And and the tea is delicious. 
medicine that has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So herbalists really love to recommend the, the linden tea to their clients. So if we were in April and you were traveling uh, in any elevation outside of the valleys in the Berkshires, you'd be very likely to see plants like this blooming. And those are shadbush trees, otherwise known as uh, 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 serviceberry or juneberry. And, uh, and that's the best time to locate them when they're blooming in April, because when the fruit is ripe in June, it's kind of this dull purple color and it's hard to see at a distance. So here you can see the ripe juneberries, a close up of them. And they look a lot like blueberries, but they don't taste really, in, in, to my taste buds, at all like blueberries. They taste like a cross between cherries and almonds. And they're related to cherries and almonds. They're in the rose family. So this is a great plant for stuffing your face right by the tree. And this is one of the native species that's used a lot in landscaping and parks and other landscaped areas. So you don't have to be gathering from the wild. You can see them in uh, planted areas. And so this photo was taken from a DCR property, not in the Berkshires, unfortunately, but in Eastern Mass, actually in Charlestown, Mass, north of downtown Boston, where my office used to be, as I would walk across the Charles River in my lunch hour and pick hundreds of fruit on my lunch hour. And I would eat a lot of this fruit, but I would also propagate plants from this fruit. So, uh, and here's one of the things that's fun to make from June berries, the uh, strudel. So I would gather the fruit um, spit the seeds into my hand then store the seeds in a plastic bag and put them in my fridge and then they would sit there and sometimes they would be uh, they would sprout they'd be precocious and when they sprout you have to sow them right away and so I would sow them in my nursery and now these plants are over three feet tall in my nursery and I am planting them on some of my sites and these are seeds I grew from fruit I gathered in a public park. Okay, wild strawberry is a fun plant that just about everybody has room for if you have any kind of mowed area at all. Wild strawberries do really well in a lawn or any other area that's mowed because they don't mind being mowed, they don't mind being stepped on. And although these fruits are small, they make up for how yummy they are. And also the, the flowers, the pollinators like to visit the flowers. You can make tea from wild strawberry leaves when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea that you make from the leaves does taste vaguely like the fruit. So, uh, and it also has vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some strawberry leaf tea. Now, when I have extra seed to spare, I will often do that, share it with other groups. So here, a number of years ago, I brought some out to Miss Hall School in Pittsfield, and they have a greenhouse on that campus, you may know, and they grow plants for, to sell at an annual plant sale that they're selling plants like broccoli and, and, and uh, tomatoes and stuff to sell to people to plant in their yards. So I brought them some wild strawberry, and you can see here that they repurposed these clamshells that are buying the fruit in any way, put the growing medium in there, sprinkle the wild strawberry seed in there, and they were able to grow the wild strawberry plants big enough to sell them with their vegetable starts at their spring plant sale. And I understand they sold really well. So I think all organic farms should consider branching out into growing native species as well. And this is a great example of how that could be done. Okay, so let's see if I can get this slide to advance here. Okay, flowering raspberry. So where you're going to see this in the Berkshires is slopey areas with some dampness and dappled sunlight. That's where I see it. But it will grow in most conditions in most yards. And it is a gorgeous looking plant. These flowers are almost two inches across. So they're nice looking. The leaves, these enormous maple like leaves. And this plant is no thorns. So I think it'd be worth planting, even if you never ate it, just to look at it. That's what the fruit looks like. The fruit, I have to say that a red raspberry is probably a tastier fruit than these flowering raspberries because these fruits are a bit on the dry side, but they're perfectly edible. And I have gathered seed for this plant while I was cross country skiing in the White Mountains. I gathered the seed that I just saw frozen along the trail and grew plants with it. Here's black raspberry, and I don't need to tell you what to do with black raspberry fruit. The fun thing about black raspberry is what the canes during the, during the off season, they turn this purple color. So it's fun to look for them in February when you're out cross country skiing, walking your dog. If you see some thorny purple canes, those are black raspberries. Remember where they are, and they go back in late June, early July to look for the fruit. 
Here's elderberry, the common elderberry. In the Berkshires, you also have the red elderberry, which is not edible. This is the edible one. And some people will gather these flowers and make a beverage from them. There's an alcoholic version. There's a non-alcoholic version. I tend to leave the flowers on the plants because if you pick the flowers off the plants, you don't get any berries. We've taken the flowers off. So you have to leave the flowers on there. So that's what I typically do. So this is what the berry clusters look like on the plants when they're ripe. This is around the end of August, beginning of September. And this photo isn't upside down. That's what the berry clusters tend to do from the weight of the fruit. And I understand you can get a stomach ache if you eat a lot of raw elderberries, but if you dry them first or cook them first, you can eat all you want. And I like to mix elderberries and apples together like elderberry applesauce, elderberry apple pie is better than just plain applesauce or apple pie. And I have grown elderberries from seed. It is fun. It's not that hard. Uh, you can start them indoors if you want to grow them outdoors and then you pot them up and then eventually you plant them out when they're big enough. Okay, so this plant, I definitely know I've seen this in West Stockbridge, big patches of it. So this is Menarda fistulosa, a plant that is edible and medicinal and good for pollinators. So this is definitely one you should consider planting in your yard. Now, I don't know why it's called wild bergamot because the bergamot flavor we're most exposed to is in our old gray tea and that bergamot is actually a citrus fruit. This plant smells and tastes just like oregano. So that's how I would use it as a substitute for oregano like in soups, omelets, casseroles, pizza topping, sausage making, stuff like that. Here is sweet goldenrod. This one I'm actively propagating in my nursery. It's one of the native species the American colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they were boycotting the British tea. It's a licorice flavored goldenrod, which is really fun. It's easy to grow from seed and I'm planting it out on my sites. Here's wintergreen, a plant that should be familiar to most of you where the leaves, especially these fresh young leaves, you can make a tea from. Berries are always edible whenever you find them. Uh, but if I want to make a wintergreen flavored tea, I tend to make it from black or yellow birch twigs. And you just, you could do this any day of the year. You gather the twigs, you peel them, you put the peelings and the peeled twigs in a jar of water, you let it sit around for an hour and you get a beverage which tastes just like eating a wintergreen flavored lifesaver. And yes, you can tap birch trees for sap. I don't have uh, time to talk to you about that tonight, but I'll just say it's just like you tap maples and the birch sap starts flowing about two weeks after the maples stop flowing. So you could just move your taps, your spiles from your maple trees to your birch trees and keep tapping. And it is fun to grow birch trees from seed. And the fun part is gathering the seed in the middle of the winter after a snowfall, you'll find the birch seed right on the surface of the snow. And then you wanna surface, you wanna sow the seed on the surface of the ground to get the plants to grow that way because they actually need light to germinate. And I have three foot tall black and yellow birch trees in my nursery, I grew exactly this way. Spice bush. So the main, so you, the colonists made tea from the twigs just by steeping them in hot water. And I like to gather the berries um, for um, uh, a, a Szechuan uh, peppercorn or savory spice. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Let me just say though that these berries are high in lipids and the songbirds know this. And so they will seek out spice berries to fatten up for this southward migration. So if you're gathering spice bush berries in the wild, it's really important to leave lots of these ripe berries on the plants so the birds get all they need that way. So what I'll do is gather some of the berries and I'll dry them and then I'll grind them up uh, as a savory spice for like Szechuan peppercorns or black pepper, that's what they taste like. And you can also propagate spice bush from seed, which I'm doing in my nursery. Another reason you might wanna grow spice bush is it's the host plant along with sassafras for this cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So when this caterpillar first hops out of the egg and it's about a half an inch long, it, it looks just like bird poop. That's an ingenious disguise. Then when it gets older, these are actually fake eye patches up here. The real eyes are down here. It's trying to impersonate a snake. So that's good. And even at the um, uh, pupa stage, it imitates a dried leaf. So isn't it amazing how this creature has evolved all these ingenious disguises to avoid getting eaten? Yeah, so here's the spice bush. Now, if you want to grow spice bush from seed, you want to uh, not let it dry out because it would lose its viability. So I'm drying it to eat it, but in order to grow plants from it, I don't let it dry out. So you let the outer part rot off, then you sow the seeds, that's the 
uh, dark brown on the underside of this photo. And then this is a critical component. You have to deploy this half inch mesh metal hardware cloth over any flat that you sow with the spice bush seeds. Because if you don't do that, your ravenous rodents are likely to dig up your plants and unearth them to get at what remains of the seeds in there and they'll you'll lose the, your baby seedling plants. Here's another cool plant that I've only seen a couple times in the Berkshires, and I've tried to grow this from seed in my nursery, have not succeeded yet. So the place where I've seen this is in Sheffield, but I hope you'll keep your eyes peeled for it, especially in late August, early September. It's called prickly ash. And this is another one where these arrows, this bright orange stuff that surrounds the seed, if you crush it and sniff it, it has the same kind of smell like an orange peel. And that's how these are used. This is the Native American equivalent of Szechuan peppercorns. So it's like a Szechuan pepper. So you're not using the seeds, you're using the outer part that surrounds the seeds. And, um, and Native Americans use this plant, they, medicinally, they call the toothache tree because of the numbing effect. It's like Kung Pao chicken. You know how that numbs your mouth? It's because of the Szechuan peppercorns they're using in that recipe. So that same, our native plant has that same effect. And so, uh, and Native American knew that. Okay, so I hope you all know in this call that this is not poison sumac. Unfortunately, in Eastern Mass, people assume that any sumac must be the poison sumac because that's all they've heard about. This is what poison sumac berries do. We have a lot more of it in Eastern Mass than you have in Western Mass, so you should be grateful for that. But you see the berries look like poison ivy berries. So any sumac with these tight upright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So what you do is you gather the fruits uh, in the midsummer into the early fall and you just put them in a bowl of water and just rub them for several minutes and you're rubbing the flavor off the berries into the water and the water will turn this pinkish orange color and then get rid of the berries and then uh, take this liquid, pour it through any kind of a filter like a paper towel and then what goes through, you can drink sweetened or unsweetened cold or hot, and I typically drink it cold and sweet and like pink lemonade. So there it is. And uh, the entire time it takes from picking the fruit off the plant to drinking the drink can be as little as a half an hour. And all this text is just warning you not to put the sumac, the stack orange sumac or any sumac seeds in your compost pile, unless you want to be picking out sumac seedlings from your raised beds, wherever you're using your finished compost for many years later. And for me, it's not that big a problem because I just pot up those sumac plants and move them to my nursery, but you might get tired of doing that. So uh, unfortunately, in the Berkshires, you don't have a lot of this species, the fox grape. This is the one that has grapes that are an inch or more in diameter that are really yummy straight into your mouth. And you often discover these by smell before you see them as you'll be walking and riding your bike along. And all of a sudden, grapes, where's that smell coming from? And you follow your nose to the vine and find these grapes. And they're really good. Um, Last year, it was hard to fill up baskets like this because of the drought, but I hope that this year will be better. And um, and yeah, you can make grease, grape cheesecake or grape sorbet is what I typically do with a fox grape. So this is the species I see much more often in the Berkshires, and this is the Riverside grape. And this one produces grapes too. Do I have a photo of that? No. So anyway, the grapes on this species are smaller and they're kind of musky flavored. And yes, you could use them for jam or jelly, but they're not as yummy raw. But this is a species that people that make stuffed grape leaves say is the best one to use where the leaves are smooth and green on the underside. So look for that. And this is the kind that you have in abundance in Berkshire County. And you're not harming the plants if you're just picking a few of the grape leaves off there. And this is the time of year to do it in June right now or uh, up until early July. So look for leaves that are fully grown, but nice and young. And um, and you can stuff them. So it's really fun thing to serve to company. Uh, hey, these are stuffed wild grape, grape leaves we picked and stuffed ourselves. Okay, and I have propagated this plant from seed. If you want to have your own and your own property, you could do that. So I'm happy to tell you there's no poisonous species of viburnums. They don't all taste good, but I'm going to talk about several in the show that taste good. So this is the wild raisin viburnum nudum. This is the nanny berry viburnum lentego. And this is the hobble bush. Uh, and I will tell you one place where I've seen a ton of these plants, and that is on the Mohawk Trail Route 2 as you're heading up along the cold river from the Deerfield River Valley and you're going up to the top uh, you know toward Florida and where the um, wonderful trail that runs down to Spruce Mountain goes so about 15 minutes before you get there and in the spring you just look to the steep hillsides along Route 2 and you're going to see 
hundreds of this plant blooming in Mohawk Trail State Forest. So this would be in April, but in September is when the fruit is ripe and it's gonna be black when it's fully ripe and it's going to taste like a stewed prune with a bit of a clovey flavor. So it's quite fun nibble. And another fun reason you might wanna plant hobblebush in your yard is another gorgeous underappreciated fall foliage plant. So unfortunately I don't have time to talk about these additional native edible tree species, but these are all uh, additional things you can consider for your yard. I just will talk about Tupelo because Tupelo, besides having these edible blueberries, is another gorgeous fall foliage plant that uh, is really uh, great to look at. And yeah, there's the seed and I've propagated many plants from the seed. There it goes in my nursery. Uh, so it's an easy one to grow from seed if you want to attempt to do that. So here's a native species called groundnut and the native edible part are these tubers and you can fry them like uh, groundnut chips. And yes, you can grow them from seed or from the tubers. Here's hog peanut, another plant that grows in the uh, Berkshires that I've grown from the subterranean seeds or the above ground seeds. And there it is in my nursery. Hazelnuts, uh, one of our edible nuts and uh, these I propagate from the nursery. So there's the common hazelnut or the beaked hazelnut. Oops, went too far. So there's the common hazelnut <laughs> and the beaked hazelnut right there. So uh, in the beaked hazelnut, the nut is developing inside here and you have this strange thing sticking out that looks like a bird's beak. So uh, the important thing to remember, if you want to grow plants from nuts is do not let the nuts dry out because if they dry out, they lose their viability. So sow them soon after you gather them or store them in a plastic bag in your fridge so they don't dry out. And yes, you have to protect them from rodents when you sow them. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So uh, another thing about hazelnuts, a tip for gathering them is if you want to successfully gather a bunch of hazelnuts, I look for them under power lines. And I don't think it's all the electromagnetic radiation they're getting in a spot like that. I think it's the sun that they get. Uh, so it's kind of like tomatoes in your yard. The, the more sun you get, the more tomatoes you're going to get on your plants. And it's true in general for fruit or nut trees. Uh, so, and you have to pick the hazelnuts off the bushes when they're as close to ripe as possible. If you wait for these husks to hit the ground, you'll never find the nuts because the squirrels and chipmunks will get them before you do. So all oak trees produce acorns and all acorns are edible. They just vary in tannic acid content, but you basically need to leach the tannic acid out of any uh, acorn that you gather. I tend to use the white oak acorn because I find that it's lower in tannic acid, so you don't have to leach it quite as long and you still have the acorn flavor, which is really nice. The tricky part about white oak is, if you try to grow white oaks from seed, is they start to sprout right away. So red oak doesn't do this. The white oak tries to sprout right away, uh, practically on the tree, but within a week or two after they hit the ground, the little roots are called radicals come out and you cannot store the nuts this way. They'll sprout and they'll actually spoil. So all these roots, you know, I wasn't able to get any oak trees from this. So my, my suggestion is sow that nut right away. Black walnuts are native to Connecticut, but they will grow in the Berkshires and they're native to our eco region. So I consider them native. You do not have to pick these off the tree, wait till they hit the ground and then they'll look like old green tennis balls pile up in the ground. You gotta get that outer part husk off, which is a, a challenge, which I admit. So once again, if you want to eat them, let them dry out. If you want to grow trees from them, do not let them dry out. Here's how I get black walnuts open. So were this to be a live program, this is one of the things on the right that I might have made for you. These are black walnut honey squares and it only takes an hour from beginning to end and they're really yummy. I often make these for my in-person uh, slide programs. Here is shagbark hickory. This is my number one favorite edible species and you're lucky you have this in the Berkshires. This shaggy bark is not a seasonal phenomenon, so the trees always look that way. And so I always have my eyes peeled for shag bark hickory trees. And if um, I um, haven't, uh, uh, if, uh, if I don't already know where they are, I still have those old fashioned DeLorme road atlases in my car. And so if I encounter some shag bark hickory trees I didn't know about before, I pull over, I get that atlas out and I mark that spot where their trees are because I want to remember that spot. So, okay, so why is hickory called hickory? It's from pauka hickory, which is the traditional indigenous preparation, uh, the porridge that's really yummy. 
I tend to just uh, try to get larger pieces out. So I'm cracking it open with a hammer to get the nut meats out. Now, this is a species that you also don't have to pick off the tree. You can wait till the nuts hit the ground. Don't wait too long or the squirrels eventually will take them all away. And there's the penny for scale. And uh, if I have time, I'll show you how to get these big pieces out of the shagbark hickory because uh, there's a bit of a trick to it. And so here's the maple hickory nut pie, the recipes in my book. It's the New England version of pecan pie. And virtually everybody I feed this to say, this is even better than pecan pie. And here's several cookies I make from shagbark hickory. So um, I did a program with a Native American group in uh, Southeastern Mass today, and I brought them some of these triple maple hickory nut sandwich cookies, which uh, they definitely enjoyed. And um, so uh, I store hickory nuts in the fridge, the ones I want to propagate from seed, and then I'll pull them out. And as soon as they hit room temperature, within a week or so, they start to sprout, and then you can sew them. And so here, once again, is that hardware cloth I'm deploying for all the uh, nuts that I'm growing to make sure that the ravenous rodents don't um, uh, dig these plants up. In fact, I'm now using cross-hatched wire to wire these uh, um, uh, pieces of the harbor cloth in there because the squirrels and chipmunks just figured out, hey, I can pry this open and get the nuts that way. So <laughs> I've had to put an additional layer of protection on those pots so the, the, the uh, plants stay safe. Juicem artichoke, this is an interesting story. So this is a plant that the earliest European explorers to the new world, like the Jacques Cartier and the uh, uh, Samuel de Champlain types saw growing all over Lower Canada when they explored there, but it's a plant that's actually native to the plain states. So how did it get to the Northeast region? It got here because our indigenous tribes traded for it, is we had other stuff that appealed to the Midwestern tribes and we got drew some artichoke tubers in return. And it is very likely patches where there are wild drew some artichoke scoring are patches that were planted or are descended from patches originally established by Native Americans. And I do know of wild drew some artichoke patches in Berkshire County. And that's the edible part. So this is mainly an off-season edible opportunity. The tubers have all sprouted out to produce this year's plants. So this is more like a September, October to next April opportunity to harvest them. Okay, so with the remaining time in my slideshow to leave some time for questions, I'm just gonna tell you what I'm doing with all these edible native plants I've just talked to you about. So as Charlotte mentioned before, I have now playing the role of Johnny Appleseed for native edible plants. So there's over 190 species that fall into that category. I figured out how to propagate over a hundred of them. And I have over a thousand plants in my nursery and I'm collaborating with these different groups to plant them out in appropriate places in their properties. So, so this list is online. If you wanna know what's native and what's edible, I have uh, compiled this list. If you have any trouble finding this online, feel free to send me an email, which I'll include at the end of my talk and I will point you to where this lives on the internet. So here is my stratification fridge. So stratification is just a fancy word for winter. So when I talked about sowing, storing seeds in plastic bags and putting them in the fridge, this is where I do it, in my basement. And this is organized a little bit better than when I took these photos. And basically what I'm doing is I'm separating the dry seeds from the wet seeds. So the seeds that you need to store wet uh, to prevent them from... Um, uh, becoming um, uh, dead, uh, you need to check them for sprouting every two to three weeks because they will sprout in the dark in their plastic bags if their little timers go off and they figure, hey, it's time for me to be growing. And then when you see them sprouting, you have to sow them right away. The seeds you're storing dry, that will not be an issue. Okay, and then I'm mostly sowing stuff outside, uh, which I learned from Heather McCargo for founded the Wild Seed Project, basically because that's how it happens in nature. And when you're lucky, this winter was not a winter like this, you'll get a nice coating of snow that will last the entire winter and insulate your plants. So because this didn't happen, we had that record cold snap in early February, I lost a bunch of plants that got too cold, uh, which was a sad story. And yes, for the seed that does sprout early, I have, my mother has a, a solar room attached to your, her house where I'm able to start some stuff indoors. And so here's a, a, a shot of my nursery, another shot of my nursery. You don't have to read through this list. It's just a list of some of the sites where I've done some planting. So here's a site on an island that the trustees of reservations owns 
off the coast of Marblehead, where I just saw some good habitat for beach plums, but there weren't any beach plums out there. So I contacted the trustees. I said, would you mind if I planted some beach plums out there? And they said, no, uh, go ahead. We recognize the ecological value of this plant. And so um, so I walked this, the island. I found some good habitat for beach plums. I dug some holes. I organized some volunteers. And we took the beach plums over the mudflats at low tide to get out to that island. We put them in the holes I had dug. We planted them. And I would be misleading you if I said every single plant we put in, they're all thriving. I made some rookie mistakes when I put those plants in. And so there's only six of the original 14 left, but those six are doing very well and producing fruit, which I'm happy to say. So, uh, so that's great. That's a success in my book. Here's another island in Salem Harbor where I do an annual edibles walk on 10 acres that's owned by the Essex National Heritage Area. So it's the Northeastern Mass equivalent of the Upper Housatonic Heritage Area. And um, and I do it in an annual edibles walk. So if you ever find yourself in Eastern Mass in the summer, you could join us for that. So uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club and the state DCR have some paddler access campsites to the Connecticut River. And they found out what I was doing. And they says, Russ, how about you plant some of your native edibles on these campsites? So this one is in Waitley where um, uh, Kristen Sykes, who now is another job, but when she was working for the AMC, she helped me put in some plants there. And here's a site in uh, Montague where we also put in some uh, plants. Now, there was no flowering raspberry on this site, so I planted that there. There was, however, a spice bush, so I didn't have to plant that there because it was already there. So here is Riverwalk uh, that uh, Charlotte mentioned before, a wonderful place. If you've never been there, I, uh, it is a great place to go. If you find yourself in Great Barrington for any reason and you have like even an extra half an hour, just park your car by the drugstore and you'll see a kiosk for Riverwalk there and you go in and one block away from the busy, bustling, noisy downtown Route 7 Great Barrington is this wonderful solace area where, um, led by Rachel Fletcher going back, this is now almost 30 years ago, she rallied the town, thousands of volunteers, and got them to convert this horrible eyesore, this rubble-strewn, invasive species dominated, just a uh, horrible place into this wonderful asset for the community. And it's got uh, this footpath that goes through with native plants on both sides. And I've contributed plants to that site, including these two. So here's the sassafras I planted from my nursery. It's thriving. Here's the hobble bush I planted from my nursery. It's thriving. And I feel like I can read the mind of these plants. And these plants are sending me a message. And the message is, Russ, thank you so much for planting us here. We're really happy here. So it's very gratifying when I can get this message. So here's a site in Rhode Island where I planted. This is an Audubon Society site where I brought, and they had this golf cart, which is very handy to bring the plants around to uh, plant them in the sites we put them in. And yes, you can see sometimes you have to put out this hardware cloth on plants that you plant in the landscape just to deter the herbivory, which is a fancy word for critter munching, to fend off the deer and the rabbits to give these plants a fighting chance when you plant them out. Here is a municipal site. This is in Lexington, Mass, where they did a daylighting project where they took a collapsed culvert and they turned it into a stream. And so we had to replant the area. And so the town and the town's uh, contractor and town volunteers and the town conservation agent and I brought plants from the site that the town had purchased and sites from, from my nursery. And we planted those at the site. So here again is the flowering raspberry that is thriving in the site we planted along the stream. Here's a site up in Maine, where uh, this is a Maine Audubon Society, where I brought a bunch of plants from my nursery there. And here is spikenard. So this is a plant that... Um, if I haven't planted it already, and I just don't remember at Riverwalk, but this is a plant that would do really well at Riverwalk. So if I haven't already planted it there and I just can't remember, I have to check my records. I will eventually bring this species to that site because it would do really well there. It's exactly where it likes to grow. Here's a wonderful site in New Hampshire called D Acres that's a permaculture property. So it's got 
almost 90 species of edible wild plants, counting the weeds and invasive species. It's a site where I do an annual edible swap. I'll be doing one this July up there. So it's like shooting fish in a barrel to teach wild edibles there because the plants are all over the place. But uh, I have brought a lot of native edibles from my nursery up there for planting, like shagbark hickory and the uh, uh, Menarda, um, oh, Pycnanthema muticum, I planted there, uh, wonderful wild mint. Here's one of my more recent sites. So this is a Miyawaki forest in Eastern Mass in Cambridge of all places in a former landfill that's now a park. We put in over uh, 500 native species planted in cheek by gel all next to each other. So I brought plants from my nursery there. Here's an aerial photograph of it. And uh, here is an organization called Wild Ones. I don't think there's a chapter in the Berkshires yet. There is a chapter for the Albany area, I believe. And uh, it's a really good organization to belong to if you want to uh, be able to convene with other people that are very interested in planting native plants in their yard. And they're mostly doing it for ecological reasons, which is totally fine. But when I have extra seed, I'm happy to share with seed swap. So two last resources I want to point you to. Here's a great book called Native Plant Agriculture. And this is especially applicable to farms that want to plant native plants and are interested in what are the what species am I benefiting by planting these plants? And here's a great book that just came out last November, uh, A Guide to Restoring Edible and Medicinal Native Plant Communities. So this is basically what I'm doing, and I'm doing it in an unscientific -y way, out of love and gratitude to Mother Nature for all the stuff I've been nibbling on the, all these years. And Jared Rosenbaum, who's from uh, New Jersey, the Delaware Water Gap, he's also very interested in native edibles, um, and hence this book. And so... Um, this book provides, I think, a very solid um, uh, rationale why land trusts and other groups should be planting edible native and medicinal plants on their properties. So with that, uh, I am done. And, uh, and here's just a, a few details about where to find me on the internet if you want to know where I'm doing walks. And we'll have to mention where I'm doing a walk in the Berkshires next week. Let's not forget to do that. And also this book that I keep mentioning, were this to be a live program, I'd have a box of books and I could just sell you one for 15 bucks and just give it to you on the spot. Sorry, I can't satisfy you there. It is available online and you can get it from the publisher. Another regional land trust, the Essex County Greenbelt Association. And as they allow foraging on all their properties that are open to the public, I just give them all the money the book makes. So I don't keep any of it. And I just said, keep all that money and just buy more land with it. So if you get a book, uh, that's where the money goes. And um, and whoops, and I'm done. So let me just leave this slide up from the beginning of my show, just in case you need to uh, uh, access the, um, from current slide, access my email address. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Russ. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I have a long list of things, action items from that presentation. Um, we did have a couple questions come in. I just want to remind folks, you can input your questions into the Q&A. You can access that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It is just to the left of the chat. So feel free to pop some questions into there. You can also virtually raise your hand and we're able to um, unmute you and let you ask your questions. So um, I'll kick us off. Charlotte and I are going to alternate asking questions. Um, this question is from Vivian, who says, um, the Great Barrington Agricultural Commission would be interested in sponsoring an online presentation about edible invasive plants. Might you consider such a presentation only about edible invasives and your recipes for them? Uh, certainly, I would consider that. Uh, so, um, there are at least 66 species of plants that are considered to be invasive and are banned by the state. They actually passed a law prohibiting the sale, planting, even the moving of these invasive species. And because they're very ecologically disruptive. But if there's a silver lining to the invasive cloud, perhaps it's the fact that some of these invasive species are edible by people, uh, at least 20 of them, in including at least a half a dozen that I consider to be really tasty. And um, and they offer guilt-free foraging opportunity. You cannot pick too many invasive species, uh, provided that you're not spreading them around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. So it's a much smaller list than the edible native plants, which is 190 to six. 
<laughs> but anyway, so it would be kind of a, a more abbreviated program. But yeah, I, I would consider doing a program on edible invasive species. Great, thank you. All right, Victoria asks, what about the husk cherry or ground cherry? Oh, great question. So I wish I could have covered that too. Uh, there is a native perennial edible uh, well, they're all edible, but the ground cherry, so it's Fissilis heterophylla. And uh, yes, I'm propagating that one in my nursery. I'm planting it out on some sites. And it's the most, actually the most common one that you're going to see in the wild is that one. And um, yes, it's called the ground cherry because the fruit ripens uh, actually uh, where you're going to find the fully ripe plants is on the ground underneath the plant because when the fruit is ripe, it falls off the plant. The key thing is it's enclosed in what's called a calyx, which is the botanical term for the husk. So if you know the plant, Chinese lantern plant is also in this same botanical genus, the genus Fissilis. As far as I know, Chinese lantern plant aren't don't grow in the wild and they're not edible, the fruits, but the, the uh, ground cherry fruits are edible and they taste like a sweet cherry tomato. So they're really fun. And yes, I do encounter that plant in the wild and I am propagating it and planting it in my nursery and on some of the sites I'm, I'm working on. Great, thanks. I see another question in the chat. Do you want to answer that one, Mariah? Oh, yeah, sure. Let's see. So where is your nursery and do you sell to the public? OK, yeah, I, I should anticipate this question and answer the talk. So so as uh, I think I indicated in my talk, so this nursery is an expression of mine of gratitude to Mother Nature. Um, thanking her for all the wild edibles I've been nibbling on. And my way to give back to Mother Nature is to propagate these plants from seed and to grow them into plants and then put them back in the landscape. But uh, I should say though, this is not a business. I don't sell any of the plants I grow in my nursery. I give them all away. And where I'm intending these plants to grow ideally is in plants, is in places where the public can see and interact with the plants. So Riverwalk is a great example of that. Um, but, you know, land trust lands, uh, organic farms, especially the organic farms that are open to the public, uh, walking them and stuff like that. Uh, city and town projects. I mentioned the one I did in Lexington. I'd be happy to do one on a town property. So um, so I'm not really the best place for people to go to my nursery to, you know, buy plants because I don't sell them. And I'm really not intending for plants to end up in private yards. So I realize it's a little frustrating after I've, you know, whetted your appetite for all these things to say, well, you can't can't really get them from me. And plus, uh, my nursery is in Eastern Mass. So that would be a good two hour drive uh, for most of you. But if you're really determined to, uh, you know, coax me to give you some plants for my nursery, uh, I, I'm happy if you want to, you know, visit me in Eastern Mass, visit my nursery and help me out a little bit by watering some plants and stuff like that. I would certainly be glad to pay you in the form of plants. So let, let's just, I'll put that possible uh, bartering out there for anybody that's interested. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, any other questions? I definitely have one I've been thinking about. Um, I can go ahead and ask that while we wait for yeah, some others please, to come please. in. Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, climate change is out there. Um, are there edible plants whose range maybe don't extend to this area yet, but are an anticipated to be a good fit for climate change? The answer is yes. But before I answer that, I want to address the second part of your question, which you did not ask. But uh, the obvious second part to that question is, what plants are in the Berkshires now that we have to worry about if things get too warm for them? And the one species in my show that I am a little concerned about is the hobble bush. So sites like what I mentioned, uh, that site along Route 2 in the Cold River Valley, you know, growing along the steeply sloping hillside, that site is probably going to be okay. But in other places further south where the plant grows, so this is a plant that you could find in Litchfield County, Connecticut. It is possible that as our climate continues to warm, that it gets too hot for the hobble bush, and we might see it wink out in some of those habitats there. So I am concerned about that one. All right, but the good news is, yes, uh, you know, uh, let's just accept the, the the good with the bad with global warming that, you know, the growing season is getting longer. And yes, uh, 
our um, habitats are getting increasingly hospitable for species that uh, are ordinarily thought of to occur further south, but uh, you can grow in the Berkshires provided that you've got the right suitable microclimate for them. So species like pawpaws and persimmons and redbud, uh, those are all edible native further south, but you could plant them and provided you've got the right spot for them uh, in your yard, wherever you're planting them, uh, they, they will uh, do well. Fantastic, thank you. I'm I'm from uh, Western North Carolina, so the pawpaw I'm very familiar with the deliciousness. Yes, so of that. so I should. Uh, say, okay, so another species that grows in North Carolina that you may recall is passion fruit or passion flower, maypops. I think they call them down there, and uh, it's a species that uh, I'm growing in my nursery, and I have. Uh, planted it in Eastern Mass and got it to flower and to fruit. And the fruit is really fun. The fruit tastes like Hawaiian punch when Hawaiian punch, if it ever was, was made from natural ingredients. Uh, I remember as a child reading the label and it was like sugar water with artificial flavoring. It had virtually no uh, actual juices in it. But if Hawaiian punch were made from a strictly natural source, it would be passion fruit juice because that's the flavor that Hawaiian punch has. And um, so it's a really fun plant to, to find in the wild and grow from seed and plant in the landscape. And yes, if you had an extra warm protected microclimate in the Berkshires, you could try it. And here's what I did. So there is a uh, reservoir in Cambridge where I lived at the time called Fresh Pond. And uh, I would jog around that reservoir every morning. And I noticed as I would do it in the early spring, there was a spot where the dandelions would bloom and go to seed way before any dandelions were doing anything elsewhere. And I thought, OK, this is an extra warm microclimate. So I threw down some seeds that I gathered in Cincinnati, where I used to live, which is the northern part of that species range. And the seeds germinated, and the plants bloomed, and the plants um, produced uh, ripe fruit, which is great. So my experiment was a success until the city of Cambridge decided, OK, that building where that plant is growing, that's part of this antiquated water department. And we're going to tear all those buildings down and build a new plant, which they did. So they eliminated my microclimate. But at least I found out that, you know, the experiment worked. Thank you so much for that. Sure. So I guess we'll give a last call for questions. Um, feel free to input it, them into the Q&A or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, All right. So yeah. while we're doing that, let's mention that uh, live in-person program that I'm doing. Yes. OK, so um, uh, I think I said, and um, it, it will definitely be confirmed on the Bidwell House in Monterey. So this is a historic property in Monterey. I'm doing an in-person wild edibles walk there next week. I think it's on the 13th. I think it's from 4 to 6 p.m. But if you go to the Bidwell House's website, the information will be there. Now, when I do that walk, I'll be talking about everything, all plants that are edible in that walk. So we'll encounter a bunch of edible natives like the black birch, but we'll also encounter edible non-native plants too, which I will happily talk about uh, in the landscape because, you know, that's, uh, they're part of the picture of, you know, connecting to the outdoors through your taste buds. Speaking of your taste buds, Russ, it looks like your book also includes recipes, correct? Yes, that's true. Um, uh, and, um, and, and some of them I make all the time, like, uh, the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a recipe in the, oh, um, so, um, so the, uh, the, there's a recipe for Japanese knotweed, an invasive species, you know, probably one of the most hated species on earth because it is so persistent and invasive. But there's a ton of it in the Berkshires. And I make a strawberry knotweed pie from the young shoots of Japanese knotweed that virtually everybody I feed that pie to say, this is even better than strawberry rhubarb pie. 
So we have missed the window for harvesting the Japanese knotweed. That's going to be like the end of April, beginning of May is when it's at the right stage for harvesting. And so we're going to have to wait for that time to come around in the calendar if you want to harvest that. And I realize that that's frustrating for people because we've gotten kind of spoiled. We're used to going to the store and buying anything we want, any day of the year we want, but wild plants don't work that way. They often have very specific seasons. So foraging makes you hyper aware of seasonality in a way that we've lost touch of as a culture. Uh, so you really do pay, have to pay attention to phenology, uh, which is the science of just keeping track of when plants are blooming and when things are ripe and stuff like that. And of course, this was critical information for indigenous people because they really depended on knowing this stuff and they learned it really really well is they would you know keep uh their observation skills turned on all the time looking for clues that they would get from you know th things blooming or thing you know like uh, you know for the some of the coastal tribes uh they'd look for that juneberry i talked about on my show it's called shad bush for a reason because when the trees are blooming in the spring it meant if the shad the anadromous fish was running up the rivers and it was time to go to the rivers to catch the shad and so um yes so uh in, but since you mentioned my book i will also say that in the back of the book i've got charts that tells you when everything is ripe so it saves you a tremendous amount of guesswork. So you could say, all right, phenology, it's important, but you know, it's going to take me years to keep track of when everything is right. Well, I did all that um, uh, investigative work for you. So you can just look in the back and you look in the chart that you pull out and you just look under, you know, so one of the charts is organized alphabetically. So you just look under J for Japanese knotweed, and then you see which weeks are uh uh, blacked in, and those are the weeks when Japanese knotweed is ripe. It's for the Boston area, but that is pretty um, well translated to the Berkshires. You might add a week. You might be able to go out a week later and still find stuff. Uh, yeah, so that saves you a tremendous amount of guesswork. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I didn't see any other questions come in. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up and say thank you so much, Russ, for sharing your just your thoughtfulness and approach. Yeah. Enthusiasm. Well, you're most welcome. I hope that the relative lack of questions meant that I was rather thorough in my talk. I think absolutely. Oh, OK, um, I'm glad we got a video of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think I think your enthusiasm is contagious and we're all feeling it. Um, also wanted to extend a thank you to our participants and let everyone know we'll follow up with the recording, of course, and all of the resources that were mentioned, um, as well as a link to Russ's um, upcoming hike. So um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks. A lot of praises coming in through the chat for you, Russ. Sounds great. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya.